afternoon. We have John Mello here with us from Amaris. Um, he is the CEO of, of the company. Um, it's a 1.3 billion market cap. And it, it really is a name that we view as a true trans, transformer, transformative player um, within the beauty space. Um, its consumer business is especially growing rapidly, I believe over 150%. Um, so we're really excited to have you here today, John, and we'll hop right in. So I'd like to get started on a brief background of Amaris. And I know some people in the crowd may not may be newer to the story, not as familiar. So I'd love to just hear about, you know, a little bit of background about the story. You know, you started in biofuels, but now you're moving into more clean, sustainable beauty and wellness. So can you just talk about that transition? Sure. Uh, first of all, thank you for having us here. It's really mm -hmm. a pleasure. Um, the transition or the beginning really started with uh, what makes up our core today, which is this idea of taking rare uh, chemistry and making it more available and accessible to all. And the first project was really an anti-malarial project mm -hmm. where uh, Bill Gates was frustrated that there were a million, 600,000 children dying a year, um, and there was a treatment. And the issue was that the intermediate for that treatment came out of the wormwood tree in China, and the supply chains were all in a mess, kind of like today. Uh, and so he made a bet that we could engineer a microorganism, yeast, to be able to make the intermediate and really make more available that antimalarial. Mm -hmm. uh, we successfully developed that, scaled it. Our first year in the market, uh, we reduced the number of children dying by about a million children a year. And that's really what's at the core of what we do, right? We, we, we take interesting chemistry, scale it using fermentation and bioengineering. We went from that to biofuels. Mm -hmm. That didn't work out. That was a bit of a crash. And then we really stepped back to figure out, and it didn't work out, by the way, not because the technology didn't work. We couldn't get the economics to the right level. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we uh, then tried to figure out where could we go with the technology that made sense. And that's where we got into specialty ingredients, flavors and fragrances. We're one of the largest suppliers of natural flavors and fragrances to that industry. And then we decided that we wanted more value in the value chain. So in 2016, we launched our first consumer brand, uh, which is Biosounds. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's really where the story has evolved to today. We're really all about um, lab to market. We have the best science in the world to engineer microorganisms and through fermentation make sustainable clean chemistry. We take that chemistry and we use that chemistry as platform molecules for our consumer brands. Yeah, that's awesome. And um, it's been really neat to, to watch uh, Biosense grow. Biosense grow. Um, but you have now a huge platform of, of consumer brands. Um, and again, they're growing at 150%. Like, it's truly incredible. So I'd like to discuss, you know, how are you tackling the consumer market? Um, maybe touch a bit on your re various retail partnerships and your DTC strategy, and then um, we'll hop into some of the specific brands. Great. Um, I think we have nine brands now, and I, I have said, and I'd like to hang out around 12, mm -hmm. but it means we're always optimizing, we're always figuring out what's working and what's not. Um, if you think about the strategy, it's really all about category and community. Mm -hmm. uh, so we identify categories that we think are perfect for molecules that we have. And when I look at a category, I like categories that are growing uh, at least 2x GDP, uh, and then categories where <clears throat> there's a unique structure in the category that makes it an opportunity for us to really win. Mm -hmm. And then we find communities. Uh, Gen Z is a community. Uh, women uh, in menopause or uh, premenopause is another community. Um, 28 to 34 year old millennials. So those are all <coughs> unique communities that we identify. And at the intersection of a community uh, and a category is an opportunity for a brand. Yeah. And that's how we've curated the portfolio that we have. Um, and that portfolio then has a playbook for how we go to market. I never go to market without having a direct-to-consumer business. Mm -hmm. um, and we do that because I want to understand the consumer at a very deep level. I never want to be across from a retailer and the retailer tell me what it is the consumer is seeking. Yeah. I want us to own that. So first is direct-to-consumer. Today, direct-to-consumer is about 50% of all of our uh, 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 consumer revenue. Um, and think about our consumer revenue. Last year, we were $92 million. In 2019, we ended the year at $17 million. And this year, it looks like we'll do north of $250 million in consumer. Uh, and by the way, we're doing all that with 
robust gross margins that are expanding. I mean, Biosant, which is our oldest brand, uh, is one of the leading skincare brands now in North America. Uh, and Biosant is in the process of us actually taking out about half the cost of making a unit, right? So uh, it's just been a great run, but starting with direct-to-consumer, we partnered with Sephora for a lot of our brands, and now we're starting to go international. We're big in the UK. We just launched in Germany. Uh, we're really having a great run in China, and we're doing really well in Australia, just to name a few of the markets. Um, and then the other thing we're doing is that's very unique in you is partnering deeply with a retailer like Walmart, mm -hmm. uh, where they really want to clean up the products on their shelves. They want to go clean and sustainable, but at a great value for their customers. Yeah. And they've approached us about building brands for them. We have the first one launching or shipping to trade, actually, early in December, which is a brand called For You by Tia. It's a partnership with Tia Mari, who's already done great work inside Walmart. And um, we're shipping to, I think, 2,500 stores day one. So it's an exciting, exciting new brand, and it's going to start in the hair category. Yeah. But that gives you a sense of how we play. Direct to consumer, we go after the best in prestige, uh, and then we look at getting reach through mass uh, to ensure that we actually can maximize the value of a brand with a consumer. Mm -hmm. um, could you talk a little bit about some of the, the ingredients that you include in your, in your consumer products? Um, so squalane is, is a big one. Um, just for the audience who may not be familiar, can you just talk about what makes these ingredients unique to Amaris? Sure. Um, and it, every one of the brands has its unique story, right? Um, Biosance is an example, and Pipette is uh, uh, Squalane. And then JVN, the fastest growing hair care brand in North America, uh, is a, an ingredient we invented called Hemi Squalane, okay? So uh, Squalane, what makes Squalane so special when we make it? Mm -hmm. First of all, Squalane originally uh, was sourced from shark liver oil, okay? Uh, and when I first discovered squalane, I thought it was horrible that we were killing sharks to extract something to make our skin look younger. Uh, and so I asked our team, can we find a better way to make it? And we decided to, through fermentation, be able to make squalane uh, derived from a chemical called farnesine. Uh, and you can't really see this well if you're in the audience, but uh, think about the clear one as fermentation-based squalane. Think about the yellow one as what's extracted from olive oil today, because that's the other plant source, or it would, be, it would be a little darker if it was extracted from shark. And the reason why it's clear and not so clear are the impurities and the oxidation that takes place. So at the heart of what we do, it's not just finding rare ingredients that are really special and scaling them at a lower cost, it's actually making them better. Mm -hmm. it's, it's part of what I, what I love to talk to brands and retailers about is like clean, isn't avoiding using certain chemistries. Clean is clean. It's clear chemistry that doesn't block your pores, delivers high efficacy, doesn't hurt our planet, and is lower cost than this. Yeah. Right? So great efficacy without damage. That's the heart of our technology. Mm -hmm. That's awesome and very helpful, and I'm glad you brought, brought the, the visuals. <laughs> <laughs> um, a category that you're expanding into that I find very interesting is the menopause category. I would love to just discuss, you know, how did you identify that as a growth opportunity? Um, can you describe the mar market opportunity there and then maybe dig into some of the, the brands you have, such as Mental Labs and Stripe? Sure. Um, like most of what's happened in our portfolio, it's uh, personally curated. I mean, I spend a lot of time trying to understand the market. In this case, uh, Naomi Watts approached me. Naomi Watts had called. She pitched our team. Our team said, hey, Naomi Watts called in, and she wants to do a product line for menopause. And when I first heard about it, I thought, well, that's interesting, but like, I don't know much about the menopause space other than I've dealt with it in my own home. And I thought, like, okay, um, I, if, I'm, if I've had to, to, uh, to, to live this through my wife, how can I actually come up with a solution that could make women's lives better, give them freedom, and enable them to really celebrate their lives at a point where they should be celebrating, not suffering. Mm -hmm. And that was Naomi's pitch to me. So when she pitched me, it was like a natural. And um, I, I loved it. She got me in the category. I then discovered this brand really through, uh, through Han, our CFO. Um, 
called Menno Labs, and I decided to not only build our own brand in the space for skin or what I'll call moisture, but then to go after uh, supplements through the Menno Labs brand. So Menno Labs has been a great acquisition. We're up 300% to last year in uh, Menno Labs as a brand. It's got 67% subscription. I mean, it's an amazing business. It's my most profitable from a gross margin perspective mm -hmm. brand. Um, and it's a brand that's really Amazon, direct to consumer, and now we're looking at really expanding through some of our, some of our retail partners. But I just wanted to share the story. That's how we identify the space. We obviously looked at the space carefully after that, uh, and the fact that you know, 50 million women in the U.S. Uh, are or will be in menopause over the next four to five years just makes it such an interesting place to be. And we now believe we, we will have the two best properties in menopause, right. with Stripes, working with Naomi, and then Mental Labs, our own brand. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. And beyond these brands, is this an area where maybe you could see yourself investing further? Well, I, I, um, uh, as part of building out the space, I realized there was actually little to no research being funded for women in menopause. So um, uh, in the acquisition of Mental Labs, we identified a professor uh, in Arizona who's actually built a significant amount of research for the menopause space, and we're going to invest in uh, 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 the, a menopause institute for women, really focused on doing great research and really trying to improve their lives, right? So I see us doing more, but stay into our core. We have to do things that really work at a scientific level, and then we go market them. Yeah. I, I think the whole world of health, beauty, and wellness starts with, is there a great marketing story, and can we find a product to throw in? We start with, what's the science? Can we actually make a great product that works? And then let's go figure out how to market it. Yeah. By the way, it doesn't always work. The product, we've, I mean, we've got a couple of brands, one of them specifically where the product's amazing, but you still got to get marketing right. And so it, it, it didn't, we didn't get marketing right in that brand. We've had to uh, back off. But that's where we'd like to start, product and efficacy first. Yep. That's awesome. Thank you for all that color. Um, before we move on to the most recent quarter and some of your, your near-term outlooks, um, I'd like to touch on the, the new Barra Bonita facility in Brazil. It's now up and running. Um, can you give us an overview on that facility? What is all manufactured there? And then can you just describe some of the differences between this investment and some of your prior manufacturing operations? Our, um, it, first of all, it's a uh, biomanufacturing facility. Mm -hmm. It's the most advanced biomanufacturing facility in the world. Uh, and we know that because we've traveled to a lot of them, and we've used many of them as a contract facilities. And it's advanced and sophisticated because it can actually produce multiple molecules at the same time for various different end markets. Um, as an example, uh, we've got three different molecules right now in process. Uh, a molecule called GAA that's going into uh, Ambrox as an in market that's using a lot of clean products. Um, vanillin, we're the largest producers of natural vanillin in the world, and that's being made there. And that's great because the place actually smells like vanillin in the middle of a <laughs> sugarcane field. And then thirdly, pharmacine. Yeah. So that gives you an example of the sophistication and how advanced the plant is. Um, if you think about the plant compared to our first factory, our first factory was three straight lines, six big tanks. And when you turn the plant on, you had to operate the plant on one molecule. That's it. Uh, not a lot of sophistication. It was built to make renewable fuels. Uh, we ended up adapting it to make a lot of other products, uh, but it was costly to do that. So we sold that plant to DSM. DSM now uses it to make only one molecule, farnesine. Um, and that molecule, by the way, uh, is now one of the largest producers of vitamin E in the world. Uh, coming out of the, the technology we developed for making vitamin E uh, with the Chinese. Um, and that plant is now replicated from a capacity standpoint inside of Baja Bonita. So think about Baja Bonita today as it sits, equivalent to the capacity of Brothers. Mm -hmm. By the time we're done, Baja Bonita will be about three times the capacity of Brothers because we have two expansion projects online. since. From startup, the plan will be full, fully utilized, right? We're, we have three lines now operating, five lines by the end of the year, and all five lines will be fully utilized uh, as we approach the end of the year. That's awesome. And can you talk a little bit about how this um, opens up the ability to gain 
um, a larger presence in the Brazilian consumer market? It's interesting. We actually bought a, um, a cosmetics manufacturing facility to be able to combine with what we're doing in fermentation to take a deeper position in beauty and uh, cosmetics in the Brazilian market. And we did that because like shipping stuff into Brazil and selling it is not profitable mm -hmm. uh, because of the tariffs and the complexity of imports uh, into the Brazilian market. So um, we are we have Biosense now in Brazil. We're launching Rose Inc. in the next month or so in Brazil. Costa Brazil is going into Brazil, and we have JVN launching in Brazil at the beginning of the year. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it is an amazing market for those categories, but you have to make product there. Yeah. So that's how it fits, right? Mm -hmm. the, the fermentation facility and the cosmetics manufacturing facility will enable us to become profitable in Brazil by not having to import uh, our final product into Brazil. Yep. All right. Well, thank you for all that. Um, I'll turn now to, to the current events. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about the more, most recent quarter. You know, your guidance does imply fairly strong growth here in the back half of the year. Can you talk a bit about, you know, what gives you confidence in that? And then what are some of the trends you've been seeing here in, in August and maybe even early September? I know you've mentioned August was a, a very strong quarter, um, but has that continued in, into a very strong month? And, has that continued into September, or does any color here on, on the early parts of 2H? Sure. Um, so first of all, August is our strongest consumer month on record. Um, and it's amazing to me. I actually was quite uh, worried about, you know, would, would the U.S. consumer, because the U.S. is the majority of our business today, continue to buy beauty at the rate they've been buying? Uh, and I can tell you from our numbers, Absolutely, the U.S. consumer is buying beauty at the rate they've been buying. Mm -hmm. um, there's lots of shifts happening, so uh, especially in channels. So there's there's a lot of dynamic going on. It's not like everything is the same and good. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of dynamic going on. But the quarter will be our best consumer quarter on record by far. So uh, that's that's kind of like where the consumer is. In, in the ingredient side. Uh, it, kind of an aside, we're also doing very well, but more because we have more capacity. Mm -hmm. uh, demand is robust, nothing changed there, but the real thing that's really driving the, the growth is the consumer side. Mm -hmm. um, if I think about the fourth quarter, like going looking ahead, look, the big deal in the fourth quarter is we've got three major launches. Yep. Right? We've got 4U by Tia uh, into Walmart. Uh, we have uh, Eco Fabulous Cosmetics for Gen Zers. That'll be D2C as well as a channel partner that we've not announced yet. And we've got Stripes that'll also be into a channel partner in North America plus D2C. So those three brands actually in themselves carry quite a bit of revenue. Mm -hmm. I mean, those three brands are all, almost a quarter of Biosance, right? Uh, when you think about the revenue from the quarter they're going into. Secondly, we've had a lot of international expansion go in in the last few months. I mean, we just launched Douglas in Germany, mm -hmm. 130, 140 stores for Biosance. The UK is doing phenomenal for us, and we're seeing lots of traction. And we're, we have 11-11, uh, right, yeah. happening in China, which yeah. is really like, what is it, 70% of the year happens on that for us, right? So there's a lot happening into the fourth quarter that drives the growth and gives us confidence. And we have, from a, from a partner perspective, because of the holidays, mm -hmm. orders in hand. So it's yeah. not like I'm, I'm worried about what's going to happen. What's important is that it, it actually gets executed, yep. right? The biggest risk we have is ensuring that there's supply on the shelf and not letting down retailers, because mm -hmm. that has been a big problem this year for many brands, uh, and we've been lucky at a cost uh, to be able to keep those shelves stocked, but that's the big thing going in the fourth quarter. All right. Awesome. Um, uh, you've discussed in the past your Fit to Win program to reduce some of your OPEX and cash burn. Can you just walk through the puts and takes of that program and really how should we think about that impacting the bottom line, um, both in the near and, and longer term? Sure. And you've got to think about fit to win is very connected to our cash outlook and what we're doing with financing. Yep. Because all, all this growth is wonderful, but you actually got to fund it. Mm -hmm. And you've got to fund it, uh, I believe, in an efficient way that doesn't further dilute our shareholders, uh, which has really been a clear commitment of mine going into uh, this year. Okay. So uh, think about fit to win as simply getting the basics right operationally uh, and really uh, uh, figuring out 
how to fix the supply chain problems, or said differently, structurally shifting the supply chain. Mm -hmm. uh, so to think about fit to win is number one, moving to our own manufacturing for consumer. Number two, eliminating or at least reducing significantly dependency on China's supply chain. Those two things alone represent uh, about two thirds of fit to win. The other third is actually uh, significantly shift how we do and use our marketing dollars to reduce them overall, and then some price increases we put through. Mm -hmm. that's, that's it in a nutshell. The price increases have gone through very well. Uh, the marketing spin is coming down as we speak, and then the supply chain and manufacturing pieces, I mean, just in biosance, it's a 50% reduction in cost of goods. Just in one change we made in pick, pack, and ship for our D2C business, which is half of our revenue, reduced our shipping or, or pick, pack, and ship costs by a third. So that just tells you, like, when you get the scale, and I, I, people might say, well, why did, weren't you doing this before? You've got to have a certain amount of scale to actually be able to do some of the things we're now doing. At the scale we're now at, we're able to significantly change the amount of cash we use to make and sell our brands. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Can you talk a little bit about how this may expedite your path to profitability? I know a lot of people are still, you know, thinking maybe profitability in 23, even 24. Um, just how, how can that expedite getting there? So you've got to think about it as for this year, it'll be a $50 million improvement to cash that we had not expected at the beginning of the year. Mm -hmm. And if you think about what that means going into next year, that's uh, 150 to 200 million in cash cost reduction or, or impact to the bottom line. That combined, which by the way, both of those data points just reduce the overall expectation we had for cash needs. Mm -hmm. That combined with, uh, I'm happy to tell you, uh, a successful outcome uh, in our financing. Uh, you know from the earnings call, I talked about a roadmap to uh, where we were going to or how we were going to finance the company. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you, as of today, we've put in the first amount of cash coming in from this new financing structure. We've been able to get better terms than we expected. We've been able to do it with less cash than we thought we would need. Um, and uh, we've been able to do it super efficiently. Because my, my, my desire was do it in a way where we're not putting out cash to service the debt. Because mm -hmm. what's the point of bringing on new debt? if you've actually taken up your cost of service by five to 10 million a quarter. Yep. Uh, and so I can tell you that we're putting in what'll be, you know, call it 150 to $180 million of new capital. And we're, and we're, we're the first cash in the bank today. And we're doing it all without putting out cash to serve. And we're doing it all connected to our cash flow plan so that we service that debt as we turn cash flow positive going into 2023. Yeah. So super exciting place to be, but again, big message is financing now in place, much more efficient than we thought, and less cash outlay and less cash need as a result of fit to win. That's awesome. Super excited to hear that, and congratulations. Um, so I guess beyond, we have a few more minutes, um, so I'll just want, want to touch on beyond this year, I, I want to hear your thoughts on the longer term strategy you know, what does the pipeline look like? What other areas of beauty and wellness could you go into? And then you talk about holding about 12 brands um, on hand. You know, what happens once you maybe get to 13, 14? Are, are you going to start considering maybe getting rid of a few brands, selling them off? Um, just how are you thinking about the strategy there? We, we, we've already shown discipline. We've already gotten rid of a couple of brands that weren't <laughs> working. Um, and it's funny, they weren't working because they were, they were bad brands. They both had different issues, but that's just the way we're going to manage the portfolio. And I think that's true going forward. I don't expect to sell great brands. I expect to build and operate. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got like my, my biggest shareholder is John Doerr. John owns about 30% of the company. John is very clear. He is building a sustainable company that's actually disrupting in markets, and he's in it for the long haul. Mm -hmm. and, and he's willing to put his money where his mouth is. He's funding what the company needs to ensure we achieve our end objective. So with that, I don't, I don't see us, even though we're approached all the time. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's amazing to me. People really expect that we're building the flip. We're not building the flip. What we don't want to do is keep bad assets. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Um, can you just talk a little bit about um, you know, other areas that you could maybe expand into here in the last couple of seconds. Um, like, 
any other areas you're exploring or any other untapped areas of beauty and wellness that you haven't really tapped into that are exciting for you? Look, I, I, I like the men's category a lot. Yeah. Uh, we're seeing men uh, really start to come into the game. And men's is a hard category because men usually take whatever products the partner in their life is using. Uh, and so it's hard to really get men into uh, go buy for yourself, right? But we, we think men's is exciting. Um, and I, I think more bringing wellness across all categories. Yep. I think that's the next big thing, and we're focused on that. We're focused on dealing with gut health. We're focused with dealing with the skin microbiome, and we're focused on really, really dealing with total wellness for the consumer. Mm -hmm. It's not just not it's not just look good. It's feel good, be good, be your best self every day, and really use clean, sustainable products that do that, so you can get that feeling without damaging our planet and our water systems. Yep, I love that. And with that, we'll wrap it up. And thank you so much, Sean, for coming. And this was a great conversation. I think we learned a lot. And again, super excited to have you. And congrats on everything.